so for those of you just joining, um, good afternoon and thanks for joining uh, ONN's webinar, The Importance of Data During a Pandemic. Uh, the webinar is actually brought to you both by the Ontario Nonprofit Network and Imagine Canada. My name is Liz Sutherland and I'm the Director of Public Policy here at ONN. Um, if you're new to ONN, uh, welcome. We are the provincial network for Ontario's 58,000 nonprofits and charities focused on policy, advocacy, and services to strengthen Ontario's nonprofit sector as a key pillar of our society and the economy. Uh, if you're already a member, welcome back and thank you for your support. Uh, our public policy research and advocacy work would not be possible without you. Um, if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, such as a visual lag, uh, we do recommend that you close your browser window and reopen it. And if you still have any trouble, you can uh, type the issue in the chat box and my trusty colleagues, Melanie and John, will uh, help you out. So um, if we can move on to our second webinar, or, or sorry, our second poll rather, um, just make sure we have that up on the screen. There we go. Um, We've got a poll for you about uh, what you're looking forward to learning uh, during this webinar. So uh, are you interested in discussing how data sharing can help rebuild more equitable systems through the transition and recovery from COVID? Are you interested in discovering how COVID-19 affects data sharing needs, plans and privacy protections? Uh, are you interested in learning how you can engage provincial and federal governments in identifying opportunities for collaboration around data infrastructure and data sharing with the nonprofit sector, um, or exploring potential partnerships between government and nonprofit leaders to co design solutions to shared policy or social challenges through new applications of data sharing? Or finally, um, and this is the one that I'm here for, are you here to participate in a live question and answer session with Chief Privacy Officer John Roberts and Powered by Data's Program Director Vanessa Parlett? So let's take a sec to let you answer those um, and then we'll move on. Oh, it looks like we have a good split. That's wonderful. We are gonna uh, address all of these um, as we go. Have we got the results up there? Oh, thank you, Melanie. Um, so yes, uh, it looks like the, uh, the leading contender is to look at how data sharing can rebuild more equitable systems, uh, followed closely by how the pandemic affects data sharing needs and exploring partnerships between government and nonprofit leaders. Uh, so yes, we're delighted to see so many people interested in those topics, which we will look at today. Um, now, speaking personally, as, uh, as the chair of the Data Policy Coalition Steering Committee uh, that uh, Vanessa is the driving force behind, and working closely with Powered by Data and other nonprofits on this issue of uh, data sharing between government and nonprofits, um, it is an important moment to be talking about data, what we have, what we share, who owns it, who can access it, how it can be used for good or abused in ways that violate privacy or the public interest, um, whether it's the need to collect race-based data so we know the different effects COVID-19 or other crises may be having on different communities, we know that data sharing matters. Uh, so if you have any questions for our fireside for chat participants today, uh, feel free to type them right into the question box. We'll answer as many as we can during our Q&A at the end. Um, and to, uh, to answer our most common question, you'll receive an email with the recording in one week. Um, and given the event is a fireside chat, there won't be a slide deck. You'll just see our faces today, and, uh, but you'll receive the, uh, the actual audio recording in one week. Uh, now, before I hand things over to Vanessa and John, uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional stewardship of the land that we live and work on here in Ontario. ONN's office is based in the territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and most recently, uh, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, that territory is part of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty and the Upper Canada Treaties. Uh, I'm joining you from Perth, Ontario, which is in unceded Algonquin Anishinaabek territory and part of a massive 36,000 square kilometer Algonquin land claim that's presently being negotiated. Um, as nonprofits, we do have to take seriously our role in responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Um, and as settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather and work on this territory and to approach our work in a spirit of reconciliation. So uh, with that, let me tell you a bit about our guest today, uh, our fireside chat, which actually with the weather outside should probably be beside a cooler full of ice and beer, but um, fireside chat is the format we have. Uh, so our guests are Vanessa Parlett and John Roberts. 
Uh, Vanessa is Program Director of the Data Policy Coalition at Power by Data, where she works with over 40 nonprofit advocacy groups, service providers, and funders to advance a collective nonprofit voice on data policy. Um, as well as Senior Associate at Social Impact Advisors, she builds processes and pathways to help organizations and collectives define the social impact they aim to achieve and build the strategies to get them there. She brings 13 years of experience working across community and government sectors in developing, implementing, and managing evidence-based and community-driven policies and collective impact strategies toward health and social equity, alongside diverse par partners from grassroots to senior leadership. Our other guest today, John Roberts, is the Chief Privacy Officer and Archivist of Ontario at the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, uh, where he's been since September 2015. He has over 25 years of experience, ranging from operational policy and senior leadership roles to government information management and digital government initiatives in both the New Zealand and the Ontario Public Services. Uh, his extensive knowledge of information management and privacy protection has contributed to his new, numerous achievements, including uh, successfully creating and leading the policy design and implementation of new public record keeping legislation in New Zealand, uh, supporting major organizational change in the New Zealand public sector, and leading strategic engagement with the New Zealand state sector agencies to improve information and privacy management. Um, and since arriving here in Ontario, he's overseen the development of the Ontario Public Services Record Keeping, Access and Privacy Transformation Strategy, the Archives of Ontario's successful Ontario 150 Commemoration Program, and has been part of multi-ministry leadership on data integration work. So thank you so much, Vanessa and John, for joining us today. Uh, with that, I'll hand things over to Vanessa to start us off. Great, thank you so much, Liz. And thank you all for joining our conversation today. I am thrilled to be here myself and to have the opportunity to learn from John, who has been gracious enough to come and share some of his knowledge around data integration and data protection within the Ontario government. And so some of you might actually know that this actually builds on a dialogue we started at the Nonprofit Driven Conference back in November. And we organized a session on behalf of the Data Policy Coalition which again is made up of the 40 nonprofit advocacy groups, service providers, and funders who are working to make sure nonprofit organizations have access to the data that they need to demonstrate their impact and make evidence-based decisions. So we use that conference session to really delve into the Ontario Data Strategy Consultation, which happened last summer and fall, and to bring together our recommendations to submit, submit on behalf of the nonprofit sector. And so, of course, much has changed since the fall. The government of Ontario has been hard at work developing their data integration plans. And of course, as of March, we've all been thrown and recovering and um, responding to COVID-19 and seeing how important data is to both the crisis response and as we rebuild it as a recovery. So we thought it was an important time to bring the conversation back together and think about you know, what does this mean for a nonprofit sector and the communities we represent? And what might be some of the pathways forward for how we could work together between the nonprofit sector and the government for data sharing for public benefit as we move out of crisis mode. So with that, let's jump right in and turn over to John. So John, I think that a lot of our guests are probably looking at your long title and list of responsibilities. And I think that this has actually grown since last time we met. So I'm wondering if you can give us a bit of a glimpse of what's involved in your role as Chief Privacy Officer of Ontario and Archivist of Ontario and Chief Information Security Officer. Thanks, Vanessa. And thanks uh, for the opportunity to come and, and talk to the, the not-for-profit community again. Uh, I think when you, uh, you and Liz first came knocking on my door about a year ago, uh, it was a, a remarkably stimulating conversation and uh, it's been great to have the opportunity since then to talk at the conference and, uh, and again today in the, in the webinar. So you mentioned the, the three roles that I, that I now hold and yes, I've, I've picked up an extra uh, area of accountability since, uh, since the last time we were discussing. Uh, firstly, Chief Privacy Officer uh, of Ontario um, is, I guess, the, the internal um, uh, partner to the, the external information and privacy commissioner. So where the commissioner is the regulator, uh, I see my job as really trying to make sure that 
the commissioner has nothing to fault the government for, that we are mature, we are sophisticated, we've got the capacity and skills to do privacy well, uh, because it is a fundamental part of, of good public service. Now, it's, if government wants to, to respect the, the values of Ontarians, we need to do, do privacy well. So, uh, so my, my privacy role in data is, is I think, probably fairly, uh, fairly obvious. Now, perhaps slightly less obvious might be the, uh, the role as archivist of Ontario. Um, archives are often misunderstood as, as just being kind of the, the place where old data goes to die, or uh, sort of the place where we kind of scavenge the, the good stuff when, uh, when ministries and, and businesses are throwing things out. Um, I would prefer to characterize archives as really about the people who think beyond just the business program. Think about the wider social historical um, implications of, of any information. So the people who keep any organization honest about the full the full value potential of, of information that they, they collect. So that's why we control disposal, not simply to kind of go scavenging for the good stuff, but because actually there are much wider interests that, that need to be to be understood in the decision making. So when you look at it through that lens, I think there's a there's a clear um, interest in in data uh, around just what are we doing? How are the broad set of interests beyond programs at all of government and and all of province uh, properly manifested in, in management decisions? More recently, I've uh, also been asked to take on the, the role as provincial chief information security officer, uh, so looking after cyber security and. In that area, there's a, a really close fit with the privacy role. Um, oftentimes, uh, a privacy breach is a result of a cybersecurity incident, or a cybersecurity incident can only be managed well by thinking about whether any uh, personal information has been, been compromised and, and privacy implications. And just on a more prosaic level, when we're uh, supporting ministries and building new programs, new solutions, putting services online, it just makes sense to think of security by design and privacy bit by design uh, in a joined up way. And I guess the final thing I'll mention about the, the cyber security area is the interest in not just the narrow sort of core central Ontario public service, but a recognition that government's interest in security ripples out through, through partners, out to the BPS, out to transfer payment agencies, uh, out to many of your members in terms of the information flows. So. Uh, a key part of our cyber security strategy is to, to think not just at the edge of the OPS network, but to think about all the uh, all the data and information flows in and out uh, and understand the security implications of that. So three, three quite distinct, but also quite linked uh, roles, uh, and each of which I think gives me a, a real interest in, in this data conversation and data, not just in a how do we manage it in a particular application, but how do we manage it as an ecosystem? It's a, a word that I think I, I used a bit when we were at the, at the conference, but that, that paradigm of a, a data ecosystem where we have many interests from central government, from um, sectoral interests, data subjects, uh, regulators, um, and always, even when talking to the, the not-for-profit sector, there are always commercial entities sniffing around these spaces as well. So where do they fit into, into the mix? How do we find a, a constructive uh, place for, for commercial organisations to also contribute to this work? Thank you. That was a really clear breakdown. I, would, I think it really pulled together what sounds like a disparate collection of roles in what actually gives a very broad perspective into the data ecosystem life cycle so we're seeing how you know everything from data collection to protection is so essential to effective use and management of that data from all stages, from sort of initial conception to as we get our archiving and disposal. So I think that it really brings together a lot of the perspectives that we're. If I could just add, just add one more thing in each of those domains, the idea of uh, a by design and intentional philosophy is important. So. Um, in the in the privacy world, obviously privacy by design, thinking about data minimization, but also ensuring that collection routines have the right consents and so on is a, a critical tactic. In the security world, similarly, uh, designing systems that have actually thought about uh, where there may be weaknesses, vulnerabilities, chose the right technologies, uh, 
connected and networked in appropriate ways. And in the archival world, rather than a, a selection of stuff after the fact, being intentional about which records are, are being created and managing the life cycle from day one so that they can survive and value can be maximized is again a, a key tactic. So all three domains are, are unified by a little bit of that by design mentality. Great. And I think, I mean, there's so much that we could cover in each of those. And so I think two entry points that we're particularly interested in from a nonprofit perspective would be the Ontario data strategy and then also the recent changes to privacy legislation. So for people who don't regularly scour uh, legislative documents, that would be to the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. So as boring as that sounds, that you know some groundbreaking changes to enable data sharing across government ministries. So we'll come back to that, but first I wanted to take a bit of a broader look at the Ontario data strategy and wondered if you could share a bit about the goals behind it and the process of developing it. Sure, and it's, I guess there's a lot of people wondering what's happened on this front because things have gone gone a bit quiet uh, of late. Um, and I think the the answer is one simple word, COVID, you know, that uh, that has, has affected things. So uh, as I said, when I, I uh, agreed to come on the webinar, you know, that there will be some things that I would have loved to, to talk about being more advanced, but for the past little while, obviously, we like like all of you have had uh, one priority and it has affected things. Um, but just to, to recap a little bit on the, the digital and data strategy uh, consultations, you may remember that there were three discussion papers put out that looked at sort of three you know, key areas of work. One around public trust and confidence. How do the public understand what's happening to data and, and really be able to, to, to work with confidence, whether working with government, with business or with the not-for-profits. Uh, a second area around um, sort of economic and business development and thinking how do we build in Ontario a, a mature data economy? Uh, what's the, the role of data-enabled businesses? How, do, how can they be uh, effective and, uh, and safe? And the third area was the, the rather broad bucket of smarter government and just thinking about how do we use, use data more effectively within the, the the realms of government and i guess for your audience uh, notable omission there is that those could be categorized as the public business and government where's the not-for-profit sector and uh, yeah i think that was that was a point that was made uh, i think very clearly in the the data policy coalition submission and, and thank you for for doing that because you know um there is sometimes uh a risk that we overlook the the key role that the, the not-for-profit sector can play in uh, not just delivery but actually thinking and policy work so uh, it's uh, uh, that the fact that it wasn't a specific paper was not I think intended to exclude you from the process but uh, uh, it was perhaps a you know a little bit of a, an omission in terms of the explicit messaging those there's been a, a, there was a lot of input on those those uh, various papers. I think it was like nearly 750 submissions in total that came in. And uh, for those of you who are public policy uh, uh, wonks, you may want to look at the the responses or the summary of responses that is on the Engage Ontario uh, website. So there is a bit of a, a playback, but a lot of the messaging that was heard there was perhaps what you might have expected. That people do care deeply about. Uh, their privacy, but they also care deeply about operating in a uh, in a system that is making smart decisions and that is using using data effectively. Uh, but by and large, they don't trust commercial organisations because they don't know what those commercial organisations are doing with data. And some of the the mechanisms for for managing privacy, for managing individual interests in data, are seen as as outdated. So the a simplistic approach that says you de-identify something and then there's no more privacy interest at play is, is seen as very you know, 20th century. People people do care about information they have provided and how it's used, even if their identifier is, is stripped out. Um, at the same time, people do recognise that data can contribute to some, some really important issues. Um, and you've touched on a few of them already. Obviously, how we we use data to get insights in dealing with with a pandemic uh, is uh, is an absolutely crystal clear 
example, both of the opportunities, but also of some of the, the practical challenges that, that we have at the moment. Um, little things like pulling together dashboards that are up to date, that have reliable statistics when there are so many disparate organisations across different parts of government, different tiers, uh, parts of the data is being collected by uh, the, the for-profit sectors, so the for-profit uh, part of the, the care home world, other parts are very much within central government, parts are, are being surfaced by organisations like, like your members. So trying to, to pull that together to get dashboards and make smart, fast decisions about uh, issues of, of significant moment is, uh, uh, is quite complex. The, the other issue, I guess, just in, in the re in the moment that uh, you've touched on uh, is around um, anti-racism, discrimination, prejudice. I mean, these are really powerful uh, social issues that need uh, understanding, that need insight, that suffer a lot from mythology rather than from quantitative analysis. Uh, and yet the data in those spaces is both inconsistent, hard to obtain, and often very sensitive and subject to, uh, to potential for, for misuse. So uh, I think what we're seeing just in the last couple of months really is a, an absolute spotlight on the significance of, of data issues for, for all of our organisations to understand how do we respond with critical, critical issues, but also the challenge of doing that in a way that is not uh, actually undermining social trust and confidence because there's a, there's a delicate balance to be struck. And I've been, been struck just the conversations around things like exposure notification apps, and clear potential for contributing to public health and, and helping people understand their own situation, keep safe. And yet so many issues that crop up at different levels of technical and policy detail, you know, what, um, uh, what role should government play if it's about an app on a phone with an individual? Does it need government endorsement? How how tightly bound into to government systems and, and lab systems should a, an application like that be? Where do you strike that balance between a more integrated, more data sharing piece that can potentially contribute greater insights and more powerfully to, to public health, but at the same time has greater risk of, of privacy invasion and, uh, you know, a lack of confidence and therefore lack of uptake. The finding the balance is, is really tricky. And how does how does public policy engage with uh, with all of the parties involved? Uh, there was a, a fascinating article in I think it was the Guardian uh, within the last couple of weeks about an advisor to the, the government of Latvia complaining that their choices and their ability to to design and implement different responses was being massively curtailed by. Uh, by the way, that Google and Apple had designed their, their API. Uh, and effectively, they were limiting the ability of sovereign governments to, to deploy certain kinds of tools. So some interesting questions then at the macro level about what, uh, what powers do, do dominant uh, commercial organizations play? Um, but also, you know, who should be collecting data? How should it be used? Uh, uh, how do we understand public sentiment uh, when the design of different apps can look very similar on the surface, but uh, be very different under the hood. And I suspect there are very few people in the community at large who really have a well thought through view about the merits of centralized versus decentralized uh, beacon sharing for, for exposure notification. And yet that has, has disrupted all sorts of development cycles in, in various jurisdictions uh, around the world. So. Yeah, it's highlighting the complexity of, of really developing responses that uh, that address people's people's needs. Yeah, there's really a lot to unpack there, and I guess the short response would be, you know, how does data sharing help? And there's sort of two drivers here that we're looking at. So there's the changes to the privacy legislation, which you know, again, you know, for the first time enables data sharing across and between government ministries, and then also we have this need for data sharing suddenly thrust upon us with COVID that's sort of you know challenging the way we do things and maybe prompting some innovation in that space. So I wondered if you could comment on some of what's happening there. Yeah, so 
perhaps just to, to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of the, the, the FIPA and MFIPA uh, amendments. There were, there were two tranches of these. Last year, there was a, a set of amendments to create what we call uh, data integration units. So organizations that would have a, a privileged ability to collect data from across the system and integrate it and then allow for its use in de-identified form. So uh, the, the legislative changes at that point allowed for both ministry units who would have a, this privileged role just within a particular sector or within a uh, sort of a ministry values uh, chain and interministerial units who had very broad um, authority to, to collect information from right across government and, and tackle some of the, the cross-cutting uh, cross-sectoral issues that we face. Um, and the design there had uh, a combination of a small number of regulated designated units that had these powers, uh, some heightened obligations around meeting standards and complying with uh, privacy obligations, oversight from the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and reporting accountabilities back to the public at large. So attempting to both have good practice and demonstrate good practice uh, along with some um, uh, some oversight and, and regulatory powers to, to intervene. This year uh, in the, the uh, what would have been the budget bill in, back in, in March, uh, the, that framework was extended slightly further to allow for extra ministerial units. So recognizing that uh, the expertise that's required to do this data stuff well is actually pretty scarce. And uh, the logic of having a small number of units really shouldn't stop at the edges of government. So there are partners, particularly uh, the examples that, that we've been thinking about were some of the big uh, research institutes in the health sector who have very mature systems for privacy protective integration, very mature uh, engagement with research ethics uh, routines, uh, and uh, some quite sophisticated data scientists to avoid you know, data bias and, and inappropriate uh, uh, use of, of, of data points and to, to figure out what, what you meaningfully can say when, when the sources are sometimes incomplete or inconsistent. So, uh, so in this year's uh, match bill, there was amendment, further amendments to, to FIPA to allow for extra ministerial units. And uh, this in some ways also links to the conversation uh, that's been happening over the last year or so around data trusts, the idea of organizations that can be trusted, trusted neutral parties uh, to bring data together uh, and recognizes that those don't necessarily have to sit within government, but there probably is a, a regulatory framework that needs to sit around them to, uh, to provide assurance for, for the public. So, so since, uh, since I was talking at the conference last year, the big change has been that, uh, uh, that legislative enablement of you know, non-government parties to also be, be part of this, this game. Uh, I would say that we haven't as yet designated a, any extra ministerial units, uh, that uh, the, the focus has been elsewhere over the, the past three months. That was one of the things that was, was, was locked and loaded, but uh, has, has continued on because one area that government didn't want to slow down uh, in, in time of COVID was machinery to do analytics and to, to, to get insights well. So while a number of, of policy initiatives uh, were paused or slowed down to enable a, a clear focus on, on pandemic response, that piece did, did continue forwards. Um, what it has surfaced though, is we've, we've kind of gone down to the next level of detail around the standards and the oversight and so on, is that there are some quite different questions arise when, when you're dealing with parties outside of government around accountabilities uh, and around some of the choices that organizations might make um, in terms of you know, transparency uh, routines to, to demonstrate their, uh, their accountability versus undertakings to data subjects. A third party can pretty much give cast iron guarantees to anyone who's providing data. Within government, we are subject to, to FIPA as, a, as part of the, the confidence building machinery. So there's, a, there's a, almost a policy tension there in terms of the different, different tactics that are available. So figuring out what, uh, what part of, of government's accountability machinery should, uh, should exist for 
uh, for third party organizations who might seek extra ministerial uh, integration unit status has been a, an interesting journey to work through. And figuring out just how different uh, are these kinds of organizations from the sort of hubs that we've been working with inside government uh, to figure out what level of abstraction do we need in, in data standards. So data standards enable us to be more precise about obligations and expectations than uh, would be appropriate in primary legislation. The, the FIPA requirements talk about you know, secure protection, don't, uh, data minimization, uh, anonymization, but that immediately gives rise to the question, how do you do that and what does it really mean? Those are questions that are better answered in, in standards than in, in primary legislation, because for any of you who have been involved in lobbying for, for change of, of statutes, uh, you'll know how, just how much effort goes in. And for anything remotely to do with technical implementation, you need a level of flexibility just to, to keep things up to date. So the, the data standards provide that level of extra detail, extra confidence, but also some flexibility. Uh, but in landing those, we have to, to grapple with just how much diversity should the, the, the system allow for, how much variety between different integration units, internal and, and external, at what point does that start to become meaningless or, or less valuable, at least in terms of the, the assurances about how, how privacy will be protected, how data will be uh, de-identified and the like. So the, as, as anticipated, these, the kind of the getting down to the really crunchy end of, of building this, uh, this regime has, has proven fascinating and not without complexity. So this part of me thinks we should have left the external people out of the mix until we'd actually got everything internal to government landed. Uh, on the other hand, I think if we had done that, almost certainly we would have then needed to change it in order to, to allow uh, external integration units to participate. So the, the breadth of perspectives that are uh, now coming to play, I think will strengthen the, the regime as a whole. It's also the, the dynamic about figuring out how to what extent do we want a very cautious conservative approach in the first instance? Uh, because this is about building public confidence. It's about authorizing a level of collection and integration and uh, linking of data that wouldn't previously have been possible. And that just the mere fact that one is doing that can give rise to, to concern. So perhaps we want stronger uh, assurances, more uh, intensive oversight in the first instance than, than might be the case later when the public are a little bit more more confident uh, and um, have can see the effectiveness of some of the, the safeguards, can see that government is publishing online the, the insights and, and the, the evidence of what is being collected, how it's being used, what issues are, are being tackled. Um, at this point, we've got a, a set of um, safeguards, but the, the extent to which they actually give the public confidence is still, uh, still obviously a, um, a matter for speculation. So yeah. from here, sorry, so the next steps really are to finalize all those, those standards and then actually start, uh, start doing some of the work. Um, the other piece in terms of uh, opportunities to, to do this work in practice, the, particularly in the health sector in response to a, a public health emergency, there are some additional powers that are available. So you may have seen, uh, again, stories in the media about the health data platform uh, as a as an initiative really designed to, to, to tackle insights into uh, the pandemic, not just the immediate response, but then subsequent waves, economic recovery, the, the whole question, what sort of lasting effects uh, has, has this, uh, this, this pandemic had and, and how do we manage through that? So, so the health data platform uh, at this early point doesn't require the sort of authorities given by the the, the recent amendments. It's using powers specifically around uh, the, the health system and some of the, the powers in terms of emergency emergency measures. But whenever you're leveraging a kind of emergency powers, the first question we get from our, the IPC and indeed from, from other stakeholders is around what's, what's the off-ramp? How do we avoid anything that is appropriate in a time of emergency uh, from becoming just normalized and, and, and uh, you know, lasting beyond the point where, where it's appropriate. So uh, I think there will be 
some some really interesting conversations with our health colleagues about how a health data platform uh, as as envisaged might actually become a, a an example of a, an integration unit using the the, the new FIPA machinery that that health have been a, a huge co-sponsor of. I think that's such an important dynamic that you're naming there and something that you've said in the past really resonates and I feel helps sort of sum that up that I've heard you say, you know, better data integration need not come at the expense of privacy. And so there's, you know, sort of that duality of how we do both of those effectively to safeguard and protect data while at the same time extracting the benefits of data sharing that, you know, allows us to have rapid response to crisis better and more efficient service and program delivery. And so, you know, you've elaborated on a bit of that already. I'm wondering if you have comments on what that might mean going forward as we rebuild and come out of sort of crisis response. Well, I, I would certainly, yes, you're absolutely right that I don't believe that we can compromise data privacy just to do better into integration. Indeed, I, I think we will have no social license for, for doing integration if we can't do better privacy and better uh, better data management. And uh, again, I have every confidence that that is, is entirely reasonable because everything I see in terms of the practices that will enable good integration that come to a really clear understanding of what the data is, what it means, its context, its, uh, uh, its potential use, the interests in it, those are exactly the same understandings that you need to manage privacy well. So the, there is no tension that I see between the foundational practices for effective integration and, and actually getting meaningful decisions, meaningful insights out of data through, through integration practice and the, the machinery that you need to, to protect privacy. So, so I think it's, it is a, a fundamentally flawed view to say that you, you, uh, there's a trade-off between them uh, and the, as I say, nothing is going to be sustainable in terms of integration without a real commitment to, to privacy, uh, without the social license and the, the buy-in from, from individuals uh, to, to see it going on. Equally, I think in the last two or three months, what we have uh, uh, seen is a very strong realization that you can't throw privacy protection out the window in order to grapple with a, a pandemic. So uh, I think the government has actually been very strong on this messaging and kudos to them for, for, for doing so, that uh, uh, private uh, pandemic response can't be at the expense of privacy. We need to find ways that are uh, maintaining people's confidence. And at a, at a purely practical level, uh, if the public don't trust government's management of, a, of an event through in, including other things, it's protection of privacy, it will undermine their willingness to, to follow uh, guidance around social distancing, around other kind of behavioural pieces. So there's there is a vested interest for for the, the province to ensure that it, it maintains a high level of public confidence through through emergency handling. And part of that is is demonstrating uh, a sensitivity to the value that Ontarians put on on privacy. So the what I see is actually a uh, an area of opportunity where the the desire to go fast, the desire to to bring data together for insights, the need to use disparate sources to, to get coherent answers uh, is a catalyst for doing this, this stuff better. And I, I think I mentioned earlier, I've, I've never seen such a, a frenzy of dashboard creation in, in my entire public service uh, life, but, uh, but in, actually in a very helpful way, it has exposed just what it means to have different uh, ways of capturing data in different areas. The, the challenges that I know some of, of the audience probably face every day in trying to, to deal with you know, inconsistent uh, data sets provided by different government partners, by different uh, different sectors and trying to make any sense of it. You know, we're, we're eating our own dog food on that a bit at the moment in, in government and recognising just, just how challenging it is to, to combine sources from uh, different parts of the province who may have their own way of counting things, different uh, different sectors, and, and try to to get meaningful numbers in a in a time cycle that's quick enough. So I think there's a there will be some catalytic experiences here that will help the powers that be understand the issues around data in a in a far more nuanced way. We've we've seen this government uh, certainly at a at a high level 
interested in the opportunities for smarter government, more data enabled government from, from their early weeks in office. And the, the, the Ernst Young report uh, back uh, nearly, nearly two years ago had a lot of sort of sweeping statements about the, the need for a better use of data for government. Um, what I think we're seeing now are some, some real recognition of the complexity of doing that, that it's not simply a matter of public servants who are not willing to share. There are some technical challenges and some aspects of that require investment. So building a health data platform that will effectively bring together information and enable some, some broad insights will require some new investment, some new spending. Um, but it's also an opportunity to leverage previous investment in organizations like Compute Ontario, uh, the, uh, the Advanced Computing Facility at Queen's. There's a number of, uh, there are some great infrastructure and there are some really uh, smart people in the Ontario system uh, that we can take advantage of. Uh, not all within government and certainly not all in the private sector. So what we're seeing, I think, is a, a real moment of opportunity, uh, which to, to take it back is, is an opportunity I think not only those of us inside government share, but there's a there's an opportunity for us to work more effectively with partners such as, as yourselves to, to harness uh, some of the art of the possible to figure out where are the blockages. I mean, government, I know, has a reputation, probably quite well founded, of, of being a, a fairly slow partner on a lot of things. Um, I've I've never seen government move as fast as again as I have in the uh, in the last few few weeks, in part because there is a, a really clear, decisive strategic focus. Um, but if you think about changes that we've seen in areas like the court system, uh, or internally the uh, the willingness to start accepting digital signatures and so on, rather than uh, wet signatures, you know, those have opportunities not just for streamlining processes internal to the bureaucracy, but actually supporting data flows between us and, and partners like, like yourselves. You know, if, if we can have a level of confidence in, in those sort of systems rather than having things printed out and attestation signed, send it in by mail. You know, uh, And I suspect that some of our data handling processes were, were actually that clunky up until recently. Uh, I can see Liz smiling, which <laughs> suggests that she's a stapled a few spreadsheets onto the back of transfer payment agreements <laughs> in that time. Uh, but what we see now is that with the reality of working remotely and working at pace, there are insights into the, the compelling need to, to bring practices into the 21st century. And it's a lot of that administrative machinery, I think, that, that needs to, to speed up as well as the data specific components. Thanks. That brings us nicely to thinking about what partnership and collaboration might look like. So, you know, often nonprofit organizations work closely with government in partnership to deliver services or are funded by government and provide data that contributes to sort of the government data sources that we're talking about. And so that was one of the goals of this session is to start thinking about what deeper collaboration might look like and what opportunities there might be for sharing data effectively. So wondering if you can comment on what some of those opportunities might be for nonprofits who are interested in working with government on data integration, data sharing. So I think we're probably still just fractionally early for me to give really clear insights on, on this one. Um, because we are we're at that point in the cycle where I think people are coming up for breath from the, the sort of response uh, phase and just starting to think about what what has been destabilized that can now be rebuilt in completely different ways. So I think we're actually coming into the opportunity phase over the over the next sort of uh, three to, to six months, where there is a, a strong realization that respond coming out of the pandemic doesn't mean going back to the way we were. It does mean reflecting on on lessons learned. It means building things that are that are more resilient, that are more uh, more connected, that are often more automated. Uh, it means recognizing that workforces of all stripes will will be more distributed and, and offsite, uh, using modern technologies rather than simply having people provide expertise and, and views. So 
I think we're, we're at that point where there is a, a strong recognition that uh, the next the sort of reopening government and, and restoring public services is, is not simply a matter of turning back the clock to where we were at this point in the cycle last year. Um, but I think we're, we haven't yet had the, the breathing space to, to fully uh, figure out what the, the new normal needs to look like. That said, uh, I think uh, we have seen over the past uh, while a lot of people operating in different ways and, and realizing that the world doesn't end, that you can draw on all sorts of willing partners to help uh, address problems and that, that there is genuine value brought that in a crisis situation, government can't do everything itself and I think has become more comfortable uh, figuring out that coalitions and partnerships and so on are, are necessary to, to handle things. So yeah, that suggests to me that over the, over the coming period, as, uh, as we don't just to turn things on the way they were, but look to redesign uh, pieces, the, there will be a lot of opportunities for involvement. Um, at a, again, at a kind of a more tactical level, I think there is a huge expectation that uh, more and more government services are automated, put online, digitized, to, to use the, the term. And once that becomes the normal expectation, then you are starting to create more um, digital breadcrumbs, more data uh, assets, just by virtue of delivering services in a different mode. If, if a service delivery model is accepted as being uh, very yeah, analog, face-to-face, paper-based, there is a, there's a, a transformation challenge in actually capturing in a digital form data that can be reused. If the, the default position is that systems should be at least online ready, uh, online capable, the more of the data assets that we're talking about will be created as a natural byproduct of business rather than as a special reporting requirement or as an, as an add-on. So I think that that desire to, uh, to, to digitize uh, our kind of paradigm is, is actually going to, again, be quite quite transformational and set us up well for uh, having a, a, a richer set of, of data to, to start using. Um, so again, a, a little bit of a roundabout answer, I'm afraid, but hopefully you, you're getting a sense of the, the optimism that I have about the, the fact that the, the, the somewhat quiet and distracted period that government has had over the, the last little while is, is probably a, about to morph into a, you know, a different phase of you know, change and building out new systems. Um, the priority for the last little while has been getting both you know, new systems in place that we never knew we needed. You know, who, who knew that we needed uh, a whole uh, system for reporting concerns about price gouging? Who knew how much complexity there was in a, in a supply chain management around, around PPE and being able to to, to source that and, and ensure that we, we got what we wanted, that it went to the right places in, in the province. So there has been a, a focus on some of those things that were, were not on anyone's priority list um, 12 months ago. Um, but you've probably noticed, as have I, that, that some of that foundational stuff has, has since turned over the last couple of months into more of the, the go forward, the automation of, uh, of processes, digital delivery, some of the more, more transformational stuff. And again, I think that that momentum is only going to continue. Yeah, it's definitely a period of rapid adaptation. And as you said, it, you know, is giving spring to these new opportunities to really build new foundations and look at what rapidly learn and restructure and now some of these issues that people weren't so interested about and how we can use data effectively to you know meet the needs of our population and what that actually looks like i think a lot more people are paying attention and ready to get in on that so i really thank you yeah. i know we've focused uh, a lot in the conversation so far on uh, on kind of covid and, and health type uh, data but liz we, we mentioned earlier the, the importance of race-based data both yeah. to understand uh, understand the health emergency, but also to to help with uh, 
I think one of you said more equitable systems. I think was one of your, yes, your categories yes. that people were. I'm, were I'm glad you brought that up because we did have a couple yeah. of questions come up in the in the chat. If you wouldn't mind addressing sure. them, that would be perfect. So yes, I mean my thought had turned immediately to questions of equity and how we make sure that uh, if we are collecting race-based data or you know uh, to the degree that we are, how can we ensure those systems are equitable? And one of our our participants on the webinar was asking about. Um, the uh, you know the, the barriers uh, to to ensuring that we we do have uh, appropriate use of race-based data. How can we address the systemic racism that exists in these systems uh, through data sharing appropriately? Would you would you be able to comment on that? Um, I think firstly one of the challenges that we have in this space is the you know, the presumption in terms of privacy practice that you should only collect the minimum data for the purpose at hand so for a lot of service delivery uh organizations that kind of data minimization has led to us a, a, a view that race-based data is not necessary for the service delivery experience and therefore shouldn't be be captured because it would be privacy invasive it would be extra extra collection um, what that of course fails to to do is to legitimize the, the purposes of ensuring that we have equitable delivery that we don't have systemic bias and so on so um, the the anti-racism act that uh, some of you may be, be aware of actually grapples with some of those those issues in terms of government collection of data and legitimizes the, the fact that there are important public policy purposes in getting a a, a race-based uh, lens on on a lot of uh, government funded services and people's experience of, of dealing with government so it provides a, a mechanism for authorizing uh, that that race-based data collection um, but also it puts some extra safeguards in place so that that regime does allow for a particular role for the information privacy commissioner to make sure that actually there is a, a public good and it's not mm -hmm. simply being used for profiling uh, again it i think the uh, the question of race-based data um, highlights that the difference between individual service delivery and aggregate policy analysis purposes. So there's a lot less risk for people if race-based data is, is being fed into a, a population level or cohort level mm -hmm. um, analysis. But if, if their personal record is tagged with, uh, with some uh, race-based attributes, then the potential for, for profiling or for the delivery discrimination is, is unfortunately in, in current systems very real. So mm -hmm. it highlights the, the need to be, um, be super careful about how, how that data is used, uh, very explicit to ensure that people understand why at a point of interaction they may be asked for, uh, for race-based data because, again, otherwise the, the, the quite natural fears about uh, about profiling and so on can uh, can come into play and undermine mm. uh, social confidence. Um, but it's it's critical that we do use some of the tools that we have got to to build that in. And mm. uh, say, so I, I what I think the most uh, powerful sort of change from a policy perspective is an increased weight on on accepting that these are questions that need to be asked and need to be answered with with data. So that then legitimises the the policy purposes of saying we do want this and we have a sensible reason for collecting it. It's not for uh, for profiling. It's not for uh, discriminatory purposes. But there's a there's a an intent and a commitment to use it to really understand uh, whether we have racial bias, where we have uh, have systemic bias in the system. And so it's it's about yeah fundamentally understanding the the validity of collecting it and ensuring that we have that narrative well, uh, uh, well uh, expressed and mm -hmm. can demonstrate the protections that mean individuals should be, be confident providing, uh, providing it. Okay, okay, thank you, that's great. I'm gonna try and squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, we had, uh, I, I've been thinking about uh, all of the non-health information that nonprofits have out there. If you think, for example, of what we need to know about the safe reopening of childcare centers, we've got a number of 10 people per room right now as considered safe. How do we know if that's the right number? Churches are allowed to have 30% of their capacity. Um, and then a participant has asked about community use of schools. Uh, school boards have all kinds of information about community use of school, evenings, weekends, and so on. Um, how can we ensure that the data that they have on that 
uh, feeds into our um, ongoing evidence base about uh, the appropriate reopening of schools and the safe reopening of schools. Uh, so another data set that we hadn't talked about before. Uh, do you have any comments yeah. on how we can leverage that data? Uh I guess at, again, the, at the broad level, so we, we tend to focus very strongly on highly personal information because that's where our, our regulations are strongest and where we have prohibitions. Part of the challenge is to avoid uh, the, the kind of machinery that, that protects privacy from inhibiting other data flows. So if we're looking at the number of people who use a facility uh, after hours, there's, there's actually not personal information there. Um, mm -hmm. That's, so the, a lot of the, the constraints that we might have on sharing uh, wouldn't exist. And I know part of my, my job as, as Chief Privacy Officer has been making sure that the need to protect privacy doesn't inappropriately limit the, the ability right. to share other kinds of, of non-personal information. So we've got the spectrum, we've got extensive uh, uh, rules around personal health information, slightly lesser around uh, ordinary PI uh, and a relatively open uh, ability to share non-personal uh, information and yet because p p privacy is such a, a powerful social value uh, there is a I think, concern that can spill, spill right down the spectrum and um, because if, yes there are people in the room and being counted but that doesn't necessarily mean there's, there's privacy risks per se. Uh, part of the challenge, is, as I, everyone would recognise, is is yeah, how do you count? What do you count? Uh, how's it going to be used? And the, the need uh, for a level of intentionality that will enable effective and efficient collection. There are lots of people who could collect data that, if it were combined, could be useful. But if it's not going to be collected broadly or isn't going to be used, then then why bother? So um, again, slightly roundabout question but I know our answer I know our education colleagues are uh, again moving from the point where the only question that they that is really sort of exercising their minds is that when are schools going to reopen you know right. which has as you've seen in the media that it, it dominates it if that's the only question that Minister Letcher gets asked then it's probably the only question he's asking of his officials so um, as as we start to see uh, you know, more understanding of, of the nuances of community spread of the potential for doing things I think and as some of the early questions actually start to get answered then we get more space and motivation to to look at other uh, other data sets but mm -hmm. I think the the question is is really interesting in terms of just highlighting what is perhaps relatively safe data that is collected uh, for facilities management or other purposes that, that could then take on a additional value uh, if, if used as a, an insight into you know, what is safe, what is what is uh, risky, uh, how do we monitor decisions that are taken and, and uh, around reopening to see if they're actually as safe as, uh, uh, as we expect. Mm -hmm. there are, there's an awful lot of assumptions that feed into to recovery. Yes. Uh, monitoring of of effectiveness is, is going to be important as well. Right, yes, that's a really interesting opportunity there, absolutely. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I want to go back to these extra ministerial uh, data integration units that- ENDIUs, yeah. All right, sure, acronym world. But uh, yeah, so so these these are entities outside government uh, theoretically right now, but uh, we, we expect that an organization like ISIS, the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences, might be one. Um, there's nothing in the legislation that requires them to be nonprofits, right? And you mentioned earlier on about the potential for commercial entities to get involved in this business. Um, are, do you have any concerns about the lack of constraints around that? Um, is there something we should be doing to ensure that the data that is shared outside government is shared uh, with uh, non-profit broader public sector partners and not with entities that might extract um, information and therefore value from other people's data? Okay, yeah, I, I think there's two aspects, or at least two aspects to that. In the first instance, I'd say government would be, uh, I think, more cautious in using those kind of powers uh, because it, it does speak to, to social license. And I think an organization with a high level of trust like ICS is, is exactly the sort of place that one would start 
uh, to use use that machinery. So in the same way that we've been very conservative in the number of uh, units designated within government, I think there would be a, a reluctance to just open the, the floodgates, particularly to, to commercial organisations. Um, when it comes to commercial organisations, one does have to think, well, what are the, the constraints that would be put, or, put around it? And uh, then I think if, if a commercial organisation had uh, information in its custody because it had been designated and had access to, to information through that, that regime, uh, we would almost certainly put uh, barriers on it then being commercially exploited by the host organisation. Um, that said, there are a lot of uh, businesses who have some, some massive expertise in, in data management, some very sophisticated tools and some very smart people. So conceptually, I think one can imagine a situation where commercial partners could do some of this work for government. Um, I would hesitate to say that all of the, the checks and balances that are in the, the current amendments uh, would be sufficient. As I, don't, I don't think we have, re have really stress tested it against that commercial um, scenario. So uh, if that were a, a, a realistic uh, opportunity, I think there'd be some, some more policy work to, to validate right. whether additional uh, pieces were, were required. Right. The other angle on that, of course, is that commercial organisations in terms of their privacy practices at the moment uh, are generally uh, covered by PEPIDA, by the federal uh, mm -hmm. statutes. And mm -hmm. our federal colleagues I know, are uh, scurrying to see what can be done to modernise that statute uh, okay. in light of GDPR. So for Canada okay. to maintain its, its national adequacy in terms of trading into the, the EU, uh, mm -hmm. They will almost certainly need to, to modernise a number of uh, the provisions in PEPIDA. And again, there have been some, some quite thoughtful discussion documents on, on that over the last couple of years, um, in dealing with, among other things, questions of de identified data and derived data and, and how, yeah, how commercial organisations might need to be regulated, not just in terms of the, the specifics that you hand over in a, in a registration or in a, a sign up form. Uh, but all the other stuff that then gets generated out of um, out of business dealings. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there is a okay. there's a whole parallel sort of policy world about what are the right settings for privacy protection in the in the commercial environment. And I know that came up as, to go full circle. That did come up as a big issue in the data consultations. Uh, right. okay. There was public concern, but uh, yeah, it's something we're discussing with with our federal counterparts. Ah, okay, that's good to know. Okay, well, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our time. So I wanted to thank you both very much, uh, John Roberts and Vanessa Parlett, for joining us today for our fireside chat on the importance of data during a pandemic. Um, we hope uh, for the audience that this presentation can help your team better understand the importance and the benefits and risks of data sharing. Um, and we'd love to stay connected with everyone. So uh, whether it's over social media, joining future webinars or becoming a member, we hope that you keep in touch. And uh, again, you will receive a, uh, a copy of this recording uh, in case you'd like to look at it again or share it with friends. So thank you, John. Thank you, Vanessa. And have a good afternoon, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Bye-bye.